Welcome to IES Online. It's really great to be here at TCC. You notice our, our view out the window there, looking at the city. Uh, we have this great physical location. I'm sorry you can't be here, but one of these days we'll be able to meet together. Until that time, we're really excited to be able to meet with you in your living room, in your house, in your car, wherever you are, and to celebrate the Lord together. This week, Pastor Dave will be sharing with us Thoughts on COVID time. It's a series that's really deep in his heart, something to remind us of what God wants to do even while we're dealing with all the things that are going on. So welcome to IES Online. We're really glad to be with you today. Let's pray and ask God to be with us in our service. Lord, thank you for your great and immense love. No matter the condition of the world around us or the circumstances of our life, you are God Almighty. You are on the throne and you are not overcome, but you instead overcome the world around us. Accomplish your work, speak to our hearts, and fulfill your great purpose in us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will Lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will see for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Will you bless the Lord today? And if you do, can you type it up in a chat box and say, yes, I will. Yes, I will exalt him. Yes, I will bless his name. And let us encourage one another with the things that we type. And let's worship the Lord today and say, yes, I will bless your name today, Lord. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Is working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all the name of all names and nothing can stand against what you see praise to glorify glorify the name of all names nothing can stand against yes I lift you high in the lowest valley yes I Bless your name, yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for my 
look to the Lord for prayer now, and we're going to be praying for three things, as is our as is our custom on the first weekend of the month. I'm going to pray for everybody who has a birthday and everybody has a wedding anniversary in the month of August, and uh, I'm going to pray the, pray the things that I felt like the Lord laid on my heart. Um, I'm also going to pray for protection for everybody. Uh, as of this time that I'm praying now, as we're doing this recording, I'm, I'm lifting up Ibu Eileen Effendi to the Lord. She's uh, she's really struggling right now. Uh, Frank Thomas's mom and Frank Thomas's sister and a number of other people uh, that are just facing physical needs. So I'm going to pray for physical protection for all of us, specifically those that I've mentioned. I'm going to pray for those who have birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, and then uh, specifically for those who have wedding anniversaries, I, I felt pretty strongly about this. I, I know it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, but I'm going to pray that for those who have wedding anniversaries this month, that your children will all follow the Lord, whether you have adult children or small children or children to come. And I want to just add to let you know that we pray for that, but you also have your role as parents uh, in making sure that the example that you give to them is not an example of telling them that they should be Christians, but an example of, of living a Christian life. And then finally, I'm going to pray for generosity for those who are so generous. We have seen over and over in IES the opportunity to help people. And when I shared last week and the week before that we're helping a lot of pastors who are really not having enough finances, a lot of people have asked me how they can contribute towards that. And I want to thank you all for being so generous in that circumstance. So let's pray together. Father, we just come before you right now, Lord. And first of all, we ask for for protection and healing from physical needs. We lift up Ibu Eileen to you. We lift up Frank Thomas's mom, Frank's sister. We lift up uh, Ida uh, uh, Angsono's father. We thank you that he's home from the hospital, but we pray that his he would have healing in his body, Lord, and all of the other people that we are lifting up in prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them and heal them. We pray that you would protect our congregation from sickness, from accident, from disease, and especially, of course, from COVID disease, Lord. Be with each and every one of us, Lord, we pray. Also want to lift up to you, Lord, those who are celebrating their birthdays and those who are celebrating their anniversaries in the month of August. Father, I just lift up those who are um, celebrating their birthdays, Lord, and I pray that you would give them some unusual opportunities during this COVID time, whether it be business opportunities, financial opportunities, opportunities to, to do things perhaps they've not been able to do, opportunities to get to know people, opportunities to serve you, Lord. I pray that you would open up doors for them. Those. And Father, for all of those who are celebrating their wedding anniversary in the month of August, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for their children. We pray that their children will walk with you and follow you, and, and they would come to know you, Lord. And we pray for these couples that are having their anniversaries in this period of time, Father, that you would help them, that your hand would be upon them, that you would help each and every one of them, Lord, that they would uh, that they would have this opportunity to speak and train and raise their children in this way. We bring these needs before you, Lord. We thank you for each and every one who has a, a anniversary or birthday in this month. I thank you for my, my lovely wife, whose birthday is also in this month, Lord. I thank you for her, and I pray that you would continue to guide her and lead her and protect her. We pray all these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Master, 
One of the things that's happening all around us is that the things that were planned, the things that were familiar, the things that everybody understood how they happened, they've all changed because of this crisis that we're in. That's why I'm calling the series that I'm doing now, Thoughts for COVID Time, because all a lot of the familiar things from the Word of God, they're not different, but the implications that they have in our lives bring out different things in COVID time. At least for the next two weeks, I'm gonna continue on this same theme and let's get it together and have some thoughts about what's supposed to happen during COVID time. Today for our sermon, we're going to look at one of the most famous parables that Jesus told and perhaps the most popular. It's a called the parable of the prodigal son. And, and I think the real reason that most people like it so much is that everybody wants to have a father, like the father in the story. Everybody wants to have a father uh, where whatever wrong we do, however bad we behave, we're always received back by the father. And I want to just say going into this story that we all do have a father like that. He's in heaven and he is the one who loves us in that amazing love. And that should draw us, this story should draw us to him. Now, we want God to accept us like the father does in this story. And, and for us to understand this story, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the story, but for us to understand it, we've got to ask ourselves some question. To whom did Jesus tell this story? Who are the audience, original audience of Jesus telling this story? And uh, the story is made up of people who were uh, Pharisees or people who were uh, very strict about religious law and things like that. And then quite likely 
sinners and tax collectors who automatically were considered uh, dishonest tax collectors were. Sorry, uh, that's back then, not now, okay? If you're a tax collector, no offense. Um, and so they were listening there. It might have been a mixed crowd. It might have even been the context of a dinner or something like that. And uh, Jesus comes out and he tells three stories, three parables, one after the other. They make up all of Luke 15. Now, the next question for us to ask is, what point did Jesus seem to be making in these three stories? And in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, where we get this story about one lost sheep and the, the shepherd goes and gets after the lost sheep, Jesus says this, In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. So it's really important for us to understand that Jesus is is talking about what the Father wants, what what makes joy come in heaven. And, uh, you know, we might have this idea of angels singing and dancing and everything else like that. But by saying heaven, it's really a, a shorthand way of saying what really pleases God. In Luke chapter 15, verse 10, it says, In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repeats. So the point is really, really, really clear. Jesus is telling us that God, and in fact, all of heaven, rejoices every time there's a sinner, a lost one who is found. Now, what does this mean to us? What does it mean to you and I in this COVID time? Let's allow ourselves to look at the story. I'm going to read the story to you, even though it's probably familiar, but let's allow ourselves to understand it. First of all, there's some things we need to know before we read it. The first one is it's a story. It's clearly a story. It's not a real live event. It's not, you know, these people didn't have identification and passports and we can historically look up who they are. It's a story. And because it's a story, we need to be really, really careful because we need to stick with what the story says. You know, I've heard people say, oh, the father must have been this kind of person who had this kind of wealth and this kind of business and all this. We don't know because there is no such person. It's just a story. Now, because it's a story, it's clearly told to have meaning. Don't misunderstand this. We tell stories to have meaning. We tell stories to, to get to know. And so we need to really look at what the story actually says. And what would those people who were listening to Jesus, at least the Pharisees and the, 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 the religious fanatics on one side, and probably some sinners and tax collectors all mixed in there. Jesus was quite possibly eating at a meal with them when he tells this story. Let's avoid the temptation to assign too many labels and titles to the people involved. You know, uh, in the story, the, 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 the father teaches us about God, but he's not really God. And, you know, there's been a habit of people assigning. I, I even heard one guy who said the older brother is Jesus. And I thought, what on earth? You know, what a ridiculous idea. So let's not assign too much. Let's take the lesson of the story. I want to read to you and let's try and understand the things that it says here. So this is taken from the uh, New Living Translation, and it comes to uh, Luke chapter 15. I'm going to start with verse 1, go to verse 3, and then skip to 11. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the teachers of the religious law complain. He was associating even eating with them. So, because of their complaints... Jesus told them this story. Now we skip down to the third of three stories. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. By the way, prodigal doesn't mean bad. It just means wasted. It just means somebody who spends all of their money. This guy's a young guy. He's got all this money in his pocket, and he lets it burn through. About the same time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But nobody gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. So I will go home to my father and say, my father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, get the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we have fattened. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now is he found. So the party began. I want to stop right here for just a minute because this story may be very real for some of you who are listening to me. In this story, the son has realized he's gone the wrong way and he's made the decision to come back and the father receives him. I just want to ask you this question. If there's some of you out there, maybe only just one or two who know you've really messed up your life, you may not eat, be eating with pigs right now, but you know you're far away from your father in heaven. I just want to give you an opportunity to understand that just like in the story where the father is waiting at the gates of the city, waiting for, hoping that his son will come back. We don't know how long it's there. It's the story. It's a story. But your father in heaven is waiting for you. I don't know what circumstances of your life and Maybe some of you are listening are far from your father. and You're not ready to go back yet. But if you're ready to go back today, I want to pray for you. So just give me a moment to pray for you. And I want to challenge you to say, I'm going back to the father. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, as I'm praying this prayer, there's someone who is far from you who wants to return. Whatever the circumstances of their life, Lord, they know that they're far from you. They're, they're like the boy in the story, and they want to come back. Even as I pray, Lord, I pray that you would receive them back. Now, if you're praying this prayer and you're the one who wants to come back, let me ask you to pray along with me just very quietly. Father, I know I'm far from you. I don't want to be far from you. So I'm coming back to you today. Show me how to do this. Show me how to change my life. Show me how to live as a son and not a slave to my desires. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I'm going to go on with my story here, but if you just prayed that prayer and you're sincere in that prayer, I want to just ask you, go ahead and and click on that hand opportunity that's there that you've let us know. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, we want to know if there are people who are responding. We want to know what kind of material we need to make available. If there's enough people that respond, or even a few people are respond, I guess, we want to be able to start some things that will help you with your walk with Christ. And, you know, if, if, if I was talking to you, you would I would have asked you to close your eyes. I would have asked everybody to close their eyes. I would have asked you to stand so that I can pray for you. Uh, I want to know that I prayed for some people. And I want you to know that you were prayed for. So when you click on that button, you will know that. Now, at this point, there's an introduction of a new element in this story. We've got the son. There's this big party. Everybody's happy. The father's been hugging his son. And now it says, meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and the father has killed the fatted calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. <laughs> He's angry and he won't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you, and I've never once refused to do a single thing. I obeyed all your commandments. And in all that time, you've never even given me one young goat for a feast with my friends. And yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. Let me say parenthetically, if you wanted a goat, get a goat. If you wanted a calf, get a calf. They belong to you anyway. We have to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but.
but now he was found. Your brother is dead and he's come back to lost. So how does this all wrap up together? You've heard this before, familiar to most of you. The younger son, he gets to come back. He gets to be back with the father. Nobody's like making marks on the margins and say, well, yeah, you're like the younger son, but you're minus this, minus that. He's received with joy. The father, who in this story pretty clearly represents God, just like in the first two stories, the coin and and the lost sheep, it says rejoicing in heaven and rejoicing amongst the angels. Uh, Because of those things, we know that the father welcomes him back and we get the message. God cares about people who are lost. And finally, the older brother throws a fit. The older brother throws a fit. Now, why does he throw a fit? Because he's, he's in that story, he's representing this. You know, the Pharisees and these, t- these people like that who wanted everybody to do what they were supposed to, wanted everybody to be careful with money, wanted everybody to be righteous in every way. Uh, they're all of a sudden, very clearly, their prejudices are being shown. You know, it's really funny. I read something the other day and asked the question. Uh, in this particular instance, it's very clear that the Pharisees looked down on him because he was wasteful and he enjoyed wild living. In fact, the story doesn't say he spent money on prostitutes, but the older brother assumes it because if the older brother had money to, to blow, he would certainly have gotten prostitutes. You know, it's that clear. And uh, I was asking the question, what do we think that our modern world, those people who are like the Pharisees, like the older brothers, What would they get all upset about? I think, you know, I grew up with Scotch German ancestors. It would still be pretty hard on somebody who took all of his inheritance and squandered it. And there's probably a lot of other things, too, that people would look. Look, the message of this story is pretty clear. If you don't welcome the lost, if you don't welcome the sinners, if you don't welcome the downtrodden, the ones who are problematic, the ones who smell like pigs, you know, we, we, we're probably really good at saying, oh, we'll accept anybody. We don't care. They're sin. Yeah, but what about the pig smell on them? Do we care about that? But if you don't welcome them, then you're not on God's side in this world. And believe me, You want to be on God's side. It's his world. You want to be on his side. Now, this is the punchline of the story. All of the sinners and tax collectors, if they were there, were laughing at the Pharisees who had just been slammed. You got to think about this. This is a great joke. Jesus sets it up. And these smug Pharisees and and, and scholars of the law have been slammed, slammed. And then this is like the major body slam. I bet for years after that, Some of those sinners and tax collectors, some of them, I'm sure, had changed their way of living. Some of them hadn't, but they would be sitting around and they would say, you remember that time when Jesus was at so-and-so's dinner and those smug Pharisees were there and he told that story? Did you see the look on that one guy's face? It's pretty clear what's going on. And the punchline is, if you're not on God's side, then you're on the wrong side. All right. What does this mean to us in COVID time? Because this is where we're, where we are now. This is what we're struggling with. Let me point out some things that should be really obvious, but it may be worth pointing out to you. And, and you can think of some things on your own. If you're watching with somebody else, you can even say, well, wow, what about this or what about this? What does it mean in COVID time? First of all, be thankful for what God has given you. Be thankful for what God has given you. Contrast that with the other brother, who the older brother in this story. He has everything, but all he can see is his brother got the fatted calf. Now, everything at last belongs to him. And he's upset because of all of the wealth of the father that remains belongs to him. And he's upset because he lost one calf out of that. We need to be thankful for what God has given us. We can focus on what we've lost or we can focus on what God has given us. Even if we go beyond material things, which we should, we may have lost material things. We may have lost jobs. We may have lost the things that are given to us. But God gives us things that are much more valuable, like peace in our hearts and joy in our families and forgiveness and all of those kinds of things. The second thing it's important that we need to understand, we don't want to be like the older brother. We don't want the joke to be on us. And so the second thing that we need to understand is that we shouldn't begrudge those that the Father receives, no matter who they are. 
we shouldn't begrudge them. We shouldn't think, well, why did he let them be forgiven? Why did he allow them? Why did he accept them in? You know, right now in my own country, I get so discouraged in the United States. I'm a U.S. citizen. People would rather see their their enemies, and, and these aren't real enemies. These are political issues. People would rather see their enemies be destroyed than to see those people be saved. Bad things happen to people on the right and the left, and the people on the opposite side said, good, it serves them right. Nobody's really mourning for these things. We shouldn't begrudge God's graciousness that will reach out to us. We want mercy for us. We want justice for them. And that's exactly the situation of the older brother. And we shouldn't be that. The third thing I want to just encourage you about is to make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to be on God's side in this present time. Look at the things that are going on around you. Look at the things that are happening in your neighborhood, in your business, in your community, uh, amongst your extended family, and ask yourself to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what it means for you to be on God's side in this time. What do you need to do? Look, I, yes, I just want to really say I'm so proud of you because I've heard so many stories of people helping out and reaching out. But let's make that the way of life for us. Let's be on God's side in this thing. Let's make sure. Now, I mentioned, I called this in my title, the prodigal pandemic. The prodigal pandemic. What is it about this virus, this sickness, this disease that makes it fit into this category of being prodigal? Well, prodigal is not a word that means bad. It just means a word that means wasteful, which, of course, to many people is the same thing as being bad. And this virus has wasted so much. It's wasted people's plans. It's wasted people's money. It's wasted people's dreams. It's wasted the lives of families. Things have been taken away from us. Not, you know, for for some of us, it was a vacation or a trip that we were looking forward to, but it's no big deal. But, you know, I'm very sympathetic for people who had plans to get married during this season and not sure whether to put it off. And even for those who had planned for the wedding of their dreams. And then all of a sudden, they didn't have a chance to do that. Trips, gathering, and then on a more serious nature, sickness. My heart breaks for people who've lost a loved one and they can't go to say goodbye in a funeral because uh, it's not safe. This is a prodigal pandemic. It's a prodigal virus. The older brother resented his father because his father forgave the prodigal brother. And we need to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that situation. Prodigal virus, prodigal pandemic. What are the lessons that we take out of that very specifically? Do not come to be angry at God over what you've lost. If you lost your job, you lost your investment, you lost your partner, you lost a member of your family, a friend. Don't become angry over that. This is the time to draw close to the Lord, not to have the opposite attitude. No matter what it is, be like the younger brother who came and sought the Lord for comfort instead of being angry over losing something. Secondly, I want to just remind you that you need to use this time to fulfill your God-given opportunities. For everything that's been wasted in your life, you've had another opportunity. For everything that has been taken away from you, you've had another opportunity to do something for God. Our God who is on the side of the lost, the discouraged, the people who are struggling, you've all got an opportunity to do that. Don't, Don't be like either brother. Don't be like either brother. Don't be like the older brother who's angry and upset. and Don't be like the younger brother who wastes what opportunities that has been given to him. This story is not about it being okay to be, behave badly. This story is recognizing both extremes, prodigal living, wasting of opportunities, which I don't want you to do, and prodigal caring wasting an opportunity to rejoice over somebody's come home. There's only one person in this story you should be like. You should be like your father in heaven. And that's my prayer for you. 
I bow your heads for just a moment as we prepare to wrap this up. I'm going to pray for you. But I do want to challenge you about something. I want to challenge you about what I said, this prodigal virus, this prodigal pandemic. It's just busted up so many, many different people's plans. And as your head's bowed, your eyes closed, or maybe you've got your eye open so you can put your mouse over on that, that heart over there. If you're struggling, if you're a little bit brokenhearted because of the things that this pandemic has cost you, opportunities, plans, different things like that. If you're struggling a little bit with that, would you just click on that click on that red button? Say, Pastor Dave, uh, please pray for me because I am still struggling with this. I, I feel like I've lost some things that I can't get back and some of my dreams and some of my assets and some of my relationships. People are struggling. Some people are struggling in their marriages. They, they, they can't be together that much. It puts a strain on their marriage. If you're struggling with any of those things, you want to, I want you to just click that. And my prayer now, my prayer now is for you to learn the lesson and not allow this to be a prodigal season for you, but instead it be a season in which you draw near to the Father. Let's pray together. Wonderful Father in heaven, I lift up to you each and every person who has raised their hands earlier virtually through the application or has clicked on the heart and has signified that they are struggling, Lord. As they have come to you, now, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort them. Even, Father, though I'm saying this days before, as they hear it, your Spirit is there and ministering to them. Their prayer is heard. Their prayer is answered. Help them to turn and walk with you. May we not be wasted lives. May we not be angry people. May we instead rejoice in the things that the Father does. And now, my brothers and my sisters, I pray that each and every one of you would examine yourself in this pandemic time, in this prodigal pandemic time where our Days of our lives and our opportunities and our plans have been destroyed and wasted by this. That we would turn it around. That we would come to the Father. That those who are lost would find their way home. That those who are home would encourage the lost to come. And that we would live for him. And I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit would be with you. In this world of virtuality, may the Holy Spirit, who binds us together, even when we are far apart, draw each and every one of you to follow him. I pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you 